I'm Jace Lakob, and you're listening to Masterpiece Studio. Over the last four seasons of Unforgotten, we've delighted in D.I. Sunny Khan and D.C.I. Cassie Stewart's beautifully nuanced partnership. For the past six years, they've worked brilliantly together, solving cold cases and building one of television's very best friendships. But sadly, and major spoiler warning if you've not caught up on Unforgotten, Sonny and Cassie's partnership came to a tragic end last season when Cassie was unexpectedly killed in a car accident. After several interim DCIs, newly promoted copper Jessica James is assigned to fill the role vacated by Cassie's death. At the start of Season 5, however, even before Jess begins working with the team, it's clear that having a new DCI is going to take some getting used to. Hey, friend. Hey, boss. I've just had a call from Hammersmith Nick. Who have found suspected human remains on their patch. What? They found them in a chimney flue. They think they've been there a while. Okay. Uh, text me the address. I'll be right there. Uh, should I call DCI James? Oh, yeah, well, it's today, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess you should. Okay. See you there in an hour, then. Okay, good stuff. Thanks, friend. The whole team is grieving the loss of their beloved colleague, and as much as we might want her to be, DCI James just isn't Cassie. D.I. Khan is having a particularly hard time with the adjustment. He's still in grief, and DCI James doesn't make it any easier for him. Putting a woman in a chimney in a house with five kids doesn't seem like a likely scenario. Yeah, but they still ask stuff. True, though... What are you doing? I'm uh, just going through the history of the house, Mark. Why? The dress was 40s, we know that. Well, we know it was made in the 1940s. That doesn't necessarily mean that... And the plasterboard was made sometime between 1951 and 1967. I just got the results. Right. This isn't therapy, the I can. This isn't your chance to somehow... I don't know, look, I am very... Sorry for the woman who died, but it was at least 55 bloody years ago, probably more so. Case is closed. As of now. As we kick off Season 5 of Unforgotten, actor Sanjeev Bhaskar joins us to talk about the rawness of this season, how his character adjusted to a new DCI, and what kinds of struggles and triumphs might lie ahead for Sunny Khan. This week, we are joined by Unforgotten star Sanjeev Bhaskar. Welcome. Thank you very much, indeed. I want to talk about the the rather brilliant, talented, beloved elephant in the room, uh, Nicola Walker. When did you learn that Cassie would be killed off at the end of Series 4 of Unforgotten? And, and what was your initial reaction to that news? Well, firstly, I'm going to tell her that you referred to her as an elephant. Only in the most beloved of ways. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, actually, the first person who told me was Nicola. Um, she told me what was going to happen, and I was pretty shocked. Uh, then I got the script, and I read it, and I was pretty shocked again. And then we filmed the scenes, and I was shocked doing the scenes. And then I watched the episode back, and I was shocked again. So even being pre-shocked didn't help by the time it uh, was transmitted. So, yeah, I mean, it was one of those things. I mean, I wasn't uh, party to those decisions and those conversations, but I know it's a conversation that Nicola and Chris Lang, the writer and producer, had had about where they could take Cassie from the point that we found her really at the end of season three, um, but certainly going into season four. So it was a conversation that seemed to have been based on artistic merit and character, as opposed to kind of uh, you know, a fondness for, for Nicola, which we all were and are. And, you know, if it's of any solace to anybody out there, Nicola and I have the same relationship off air that we have on air, and we've continued to do that. So um, the last time I was in touch with her was about two weeks ago. So it's one of those things, you know, it's kind of, um, in a way, coming back into season five, I had to just think, well, this is the next part of this story. I mean, it is in some ways the random nature of Cassie's death that is so unnerving. I think a lot of crime dramas would have had a suspect run her down to, in order to tie her demise to the overarching plot, but not unforgotten. I mean, do you think that the random, almost chaotic nature of her death somehow renders Cassie's demise perhaps even more agonizing for the audience, that kind of random nature of it? I think that's absolutely right. I think that 
we sort of have a need for our heroic figures to have a heroic end and something as ordinary and everyday in the way that uh, her death occurred, I think was unnerving. There seemed to be two reactions to it. One was, why did she have to die? And I got asked that a lot on social media. And I said, life is cruel and it's unsuspecting and it's random. And, you know, the other line was, well, you know, why couldn't she have just gone off into the sunset with her boyfriend and had a nice life? And you kind of go, yeah, you wish that for people that you know in real life. And then strange, weird, unpleasant, tragic things happen. And I think that you're right. I think that was extremely unnerving for people. I want to drill down on the the notion of grief here a little more. It, series five, it functions both as a, a return to form for Unforgotten. There's a cold case corpse. Here's a bunch of suspects. People are acting suspiciously. But as you say, it is a really powerful meditation on grief. It, it's clear just in this initial first episode back how much Sonny is struggling in the face of loss. As an actor who's having to channel that grief, how challenging was it to capture that, to live in that place day after day after day on this production? Uh, it certainly was a challenge in that I don't think we had seen Sonny go there before. So he was kind of entering into new territory as far as the audience were concerned and as far as me as an actor was concerned. You know, it was kind of strange for me that uh, I turned up on set and Nicola wasn't there because. She's been such a mainstay for so many years. And the, the only thing that kind of helped that was, you know, how much I, you know, we keep in touch and, and we talk uh, outside of work. If I needed reassurance that she was still alive, I could just <laughs> text her and send me an emoji or something. <laughs> the challenge really was, for me as the actor, I suppose, was with this character that people have seen, can you believably go to those places and take the audience with you? I mean, it's the little details that, really do capture that sense of loss. Sonny buying two coffees out of habit or him gazing despondently at Cassie's office chair. I, and I think in some ways, perhaps the hardest part of losing someone isn't necessarily the big moments of powerful, cathartic emotion, but those small, terrifying ones that remind you of them being gone from your life. And I felt like this first episode back really captured both the big feelings that Sonny's having and those sort of smaller, almost sort of out of habit things that he does, that coffee purchase every morning. I think you're absolutely right. And also, you know, it's the nature of grief as well is that it catches you unawares. It's, as you say, it's, it's sometimes not the very big stuff. I mean, you know, with friends that I've lost, it'll be a, you know, a song that'll be playing on the radio or on a playlist or something uh, that'll come up. And, I, you know, I'll associate it with them and I'll, that's when I'll think of them. And there are other friends where, you know, I go places or I meet people and I think oh, he would have loved to have heard about this. And so it just catches you at odd times. And I think that it's the interesting thing about grief is that it never really goes away. You just learn to place it somewhere. And we all kind of have to function if we, we are living in a society. We have to get up. We have to go to work. We have to make breakfast for our kids or drop them at school or look after our parents. Or, you know, we have to do all that stuff. And in a way that the grief gets kind of put on a back burner of some kind that, uh, you know, that you'll deal with it when you can. And so those things like a song coming up or buying an extra coffee or, you know, all those things, I think, are the ones that catch you suddenly unawares. And uh, I think that's the nature of it. As you say, it's, it's grief is, you know, movie grief is very melodramatic and real grief isn't. It's like carrying a weight around all the time. It's not fending off lightning bolts. And so, I, again, that's what um, Chris, I think, captured very well. I was incredibly worried for whatever actor would be brought in to fill Cassie's shoes. But wow, uh, does Sinead Keenan manage to create a, both a, a space and a tone for Jess that's completely different to Cassie. I know that uh, you and Sinead had one previous credit in common, which was the Comedy Porters. Did you reach out to Sinead ahead of production to talk or did you look to keep your distance in order to mirror that chasm between Sonny and Jess? Well, the one time that we had worked together, we were facing each other for 30 seconds. We had a line each, and then she gets up and leaves. And that was it. That was some years ago. Um, she really had the most difficult job of anybody coming into this. And as you say, it's 
and unenviable thing to try to uh, take that role. But as soon as I found out she had been cast, I did get in touch with her. And I said, look, it suddenly strikes me that you, Sinead, are going to be going through exactly the same thing as your character, Jesse, coming into this. You're coming into this cast and this production where everybody knows each other. Everyone loved the person who's not there anymore. And how are you going to win people over? And that's exactly the same as Jesse. So I said to her, well, look, do you want to meet up beforehand? Just so we can sit and chat. And I, did, I didn't want her to come in on the first day and feel alienated and, and not know anybody. And so uh, we managed to get a Zoom in at that point. It's quite a long Zoom that we had. And it just meant that we had references that on day one, we could sort of refer to that as opposed to her newness. But, you know, as you said, I mean, she nailed it. I mean, she was fantastic from day one. She's very rooted and grounded as an actor. And she was just a delight to work with. And so it's a great energy to kind of work off of against, actually, and a great energy on set as well. It kind of, uh, it permeates through everybody else. Everybody wants to do their best work. And one of the things that, you know, that was said, actually, you know, we've had the same director on each season, Andy Wilson. And when Sinead wrapped the entire series, her last scene, you know, everybody kind of you know, applauds and, you know, well done, and you get a bunch of flowers. And, but the one thing, the only thing he said was, boots filled, hmm. which kind of said it all. That does say it all. Uh, you know, she, Jess, Jesse actually says, I'm aware of the boots I'm filling uh, in this episode. And I, without spoiling anything, I have to agree with uh, Andy Wilson here is that the uh, the boots are filled. The scene at the gravesite in episode one demonstrates that Unforgotten, like Sonny himself, hasn't forgotten about Cassie. Hello? Sal, I'm so sorry. What happened? I was working late on the case. I forgot my phone in the car. I'm really sorry. Right. What did you cook? Nothing special. There's a bowl for you in the fridge if you're still hungry. Definitely. I I'm leaving right now. Yeah, I will be asleep. I've got that Leeds thing tomorrow. Seven o'clock train, so... Um... Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh... I'm sorry again. No problem. I love you. Love you too. Instead of being at home with... Fiance Sal with the living, Sonny's here head in hand with the with the dead. Uh, and he's certainly angrier by far than we've seen him throughout the previous four series. He kicks the hell out of the gents in an act of frustration. Is this anger boiling over, or is it the the only way he knows how to vent these very pent-up emotions he's feeling when he really can't talk to Sal about this? Yeah, I think, I mean, one thing I will say is that the gents' door that I kind of beat on, the only thing I was disappointed with that scene was that in the first take, I knocked the door <laughs> and they kind of went, now we're going to repair it. And I said, oh, come on, it's the most macho thing I've ever done. So that was a slight disappointment on a personal note. But uh, yeah, I think that, again, I think that um, grief is one of those things that emerges in all sorts of ways. And particularly if you don't have people that you can talk to, if you if you don't have a, an outlet for it, then anger is one of those things that will kind of reveal itself. And it's frustration. It's frustration at not being able to move on, at not being able to... It needs got guilt that's going around, which a lot of people do feel, particularly uh, with an untimely death. You know, people feel, should I have done more? Should I have seen more? Should I have kind of noticed something? And I think he is in this position where he doesn't really know who he can say that to. You know, he's loyal to his team. He doesn't want to burden them with it. He doesn't have that relationship with them. With Sal, it's a relatively new relationship. He's not quite sure what to say to her. And so, yeah, I think that anger is born out of frustration. It's driving him crazy and he doesn't know how to process it. Before this next question, a brief word from our sponsors. Ocean voyages, expeditions, river journeys. Viking is dedicated to bringing travelers closer to the destination, offering a small ship experience and a shore excursion in every port. Learn more at viking.com. 
This isn't therapy, D.I. Khan, Jesse tells Sunny as he wants to pursue the cold case that she'd rather get off their books. But the body that they've discovered in the chimney isn't from the 1940s after all, but it's recent, 2016 recent, as Fran discovers. Go on. I had it stuck through a spectrograph, and it's actually Snaper. And Snaper & Co. is a vintage shop that opened in early 2010. Oh. Just come from there. They've confirmed that is their label. Here's the singer. Did a search on their website and found the actual dress. The actual dress? Yep. It's the only Del Mio one they've ever had. And it sold for $29.99 at their Portobello store in early June 2016. How was it paid for? Debit card. So, unless someone redressed a corpse, our victim died no more than six years ago. Why is it important to Sonny that he pursue this, and how is it connected to what would have been Cassie's approach? Well, I think he and Cassie would have had the same approach, which was that um, anyone who has died in such kind of awful circumstances deserves justice. And whether that's 10 years or 20 years or 30 years in the first series that we did, it was a murder that had happened in the 1970s. And so that sense of we have to pursue this, we have to do right by somebody, you know, these, anybody who kind of uh, is um, unfortunate enough to end up in that kind of tragic state when you're, you know, sort of murdered particularly, is that, you know, there are kind of, there are families, there are children, there are grandchildren, there are kind of nephews, there are aunts. I mean, this it's not kind of closure uh, just because it happened some time ago. And I think that for him, I think that's where he and Cassie were absolutely on the same page. They absolutely knew the importance of small justices, let alone big justices. And that's why I think he's kind of hell-bent on pursuing this. The team seems to be rather huddled up in this episode. There's a real sense of sort of us versus them, them being Jesse James here. She's results-oriented, budget-focused. She lacks a sense of mission at the moment. How well does Sunny shoulder the burden of being the de facto leader to the team, the one they look to now with Cassie gone? Is he wearing that mantle comfortably? Uh, I think he's wearing it uncomfortably. Um, I think that he's very devoted to the team. I think he's very protective uh, of the team as well. So anybody new coming in, he wants to know that that team is going to be looked after. Uh, So in that sense, I think he can be a leader and he is a leader. At the same time, he does look at that empty office and thinks there was a purpose to what I did before. And part of that meaning came from his close friendship with his work partner. And now that's not there. And I think that's why he kind of carries the, the mantle uncomfortably. I mean, he does take a certain cruel delight in telling Jesse that he turned down her job, even though they begged him to take it. He says it with a little more color than that. Did you apply for this job, dear Khan? No. But it was offered to me multiple times. In fact, they begged me. Why does he torment her with this knowledge? What is he sort of hoping to achieve here? Is he just needling her or is he acting defensively? How did you read that scene? I kind of read it as it was Jessie's discomfort and vulnerability at that point. She knows that the team haven't warmed to her. She knows the boots that she's required to fill. And also, I think crucially, I think for Jessie's character, and, and again, a really great bit of writing from Chris, is that we discover something about Jess at the very top of the first episode. And that kind of allows us to see that she's not perhaps working at her best either. So I think her kind of lack of control in the situation brings forth the way that she speaks and the way she questions Sonny about how he's approaching the work. I didn't read it as him taking delight in it so much as him trying to just put her straight. I can't help thinking that that Sonny's proposal to Sal while waiting for Cassie to come out of brain surgery at the end of series four would be a double-edged sword. It is this sort of moment of love born out of anxiety and dread that now has to blossom under the withering glare of grief. Do you think that Sonny regrets the proposal now or is he just feeling completely overwhelmed by everything that's going on? Uh, that's uh, very well put. 
Jace. I think um, that the kind of emotions that are whirling around when one is under pressure. Um, I was saying this recently to some students that, you know, when we get overwhelmed, whether it be by grief or anger or love or beauty or anything, uh, we lose perspective. And we are battling to create some kind of context and perspective from the same head that is overwhelmed. And so very often the decisions one makes when one is overwhelmed are not going to be the same as the ones that one would make when one is calm. And so I think that Sonny, I think, ultimately understands that. I don't think he possibly understood that at the time because he was overwhelmed. But I think in time, I think he does realize that it was coming from a space that wasn't necessarily calm, Sonny. So I don't think ultimately he regrets it. I think, you know, people regret the effect that has on other people. But I don't think he regrets it. I think that he kind of ultimately understands that he wasn't being him at that point. Sonny has drafted a resignation letter, one that he closes uh, when Fran is able to prove that the corpse in the chimney died recently, clearing that that rather arbitrary bar that Jesse has set for the team. What prompts Sonny's change of heart here? Is it having a mission again? Is it perhaps that this cold case is the therapy he needs after all? Uh, again, that's a very good observation, Jace. I think yes. I think yes to all those things. I think that suddenly he's back in that zone of what he and Cassie did well, which was here's a puzzle. These things, you've got to find the pieces before you can put the puzzle together. And that is a moment that turns him. And secondly, it is a chance for him to kind of let Jesse know that this is what this team is good at, because she doesn't believe that at the moment. And so in that sense, I think it probably is therapy. I think that it's the game is afoot. (laughs) Okay, let's go. This is not politics anymore. This is about those kind of weird, strange shaped jigsaw puzzle pieces of which we don't have all of them, but we've got two or three that now fit and he can see a picture. And so I think, yeah, I think that is a kind of therapy. Sonny's backpack for this first episode contained, among many other things, some coconut mango incense sticks and heart-shaped glasses. Are you still surprised by how much viewers are obsessed with what's in Sonny's backpack? I'm delighted by it. I, I mean, it was. Um, it's, this is from the second series onwards. And what I have done, actually, I think I did it on the last series, but I have done for this series, is that I've kept some of those uh, Sonny backpack contents, especially the PBS viewers. Oh. So there'll be six that will not have been seen before that I've kept back for PBS Masterpiece viewers. So, um, yeah, I'm just delighted. It's kind of, it's, I kind of worried about it um, on the second season when I started to to post the pictures because I thought, oh, is this going to take away from, you know, the mystery and the drama and everything else? But actually what was lovely is that you know, the audience has responded really well and and very fondly to it. And I do not look in the bag throughout the day. I genuinely kind of open it up only when we've wrapped for the day and then take a picture of the content and then post the best ones. So, yeah, it's really lovely that people have kind of gotten onto that. I mean, you know, at the very beginning, it was just a prop. It was just, they said, you want a bag? And they gave me some briefcases and some shoulder bags. And, and I asked for a backpack because I thought it was practical and you had kids and, you know, you can use it on weekends, little realizing the kind of attention it would get. I love it. Now I've spotted them all over the place. Uh, you're just a trendsetter. That's all it is. That's the only time that I'll ever be. <laughs> uh, finally, we've got our body. We've got a slew of suspects. What can you tease about where the storyline is going this series on Unforgotten? It's another twisty one. Once again, when I was reading through the script, I could not and did not guess who was going to be responsible and whether he, she or they were leaping out at me on the pages. That didn't happen. So, yeah, it's kind of, uh, you know, one of the exciting things for me was that Sonny goes to Paris to uh, interview a suspect. That was quite exciting. We actually filmed on the Eurostar train. But I think that the interesting thing about this series is that this is the widest range of ages of suspects of any series we've done so far. Mm. And that makes it interesting, I think. Sanjeev Baskar, thank you so very much. And à bientôt. Thank you. (laughs) Merci beaucoup. 
next time, the tension continues to build between D.I. Khan and D.C.I. James. D.I. Khan. Key information should really come to me first. When you're actually in the office, I'll certainly make sure they bring you stuff first. Actor Sinead Keenan joins us to discuss how she approached playing the complex and bristly DCI Jessica James. Masterpiece Studio is hosted by me, Jace Lacob, produced by Jack Pombriant and edited by Robin Bissett. Paul Stevens is our sound designer. The executive producer for Masterpiece is Suzanne Simpson. Thank you.